Welcome to Beer Net Radio. Listen to on every continent except Antarctica. You look good, Beer man. Net Not, Radio. I got my I got my BVD shirt on today. Yeah, you look. look I got to say, you look sharp, and boy, that thumbnail is that getting some that hits? thumbnail that 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 rocks my boat. I hope it rocks your boat. <laughs> I'm I'm sure that made your weekend because I know you yeah. like to be out there. I was on the internet. Gr- I was a little grumpy getting up this morning, but now, yeah, I got you, no things complaints. are looking up. <laughs> yeah, I know you like being out there on the internet, Jordan. You're a big yeah. internet thirsty guy. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. out there thumbnail chasing. I like to air it out there for everybody. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, for those at home, Jordan is is not a uh, big social media guy, which nah. probably surprises no one. <laughs> You're increasingly being proven that that's the right way to do it. That there's nothing good that comes of it. Nothing. The only thing I do is Twitter, and looks like that might be going away. So <laughs> well, and that's and that's not toxic at all. No. <laughs> I mean, good lord. All right. Well, let's uh let's let in Bruce. Hello. There he is. Wow. I I feel privileged. Jordan, how are you? Doing good, Bruce. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. Uh, great, great to see you guys. The great lead story this morning. Uh, that's amazing. <laughs> I, I, know. See that. I know it's, it's, it takes a lot of beer to write about sports drinks. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I have gotten a little bit of flack lately because we have been covering the non-alk space pretty heavily and it's not for any other reason that distributors are interested in it. And that's kind of the core of our readership, uh, as you know, and right. Uh, so, you know, uh, first of all, thank you for being on BeerNet Radio. You've reached the pinnacle of your career now. You can <laughs> finally retire. No, it's, uh, it's, it's the podcast where everybody's dreams come true. And so uh, we're going to keep it brief. We're going to keep it quick. We're going to keep it fun. All right. And so Bruce Jacobson, uh, the CEO of BioSteel, which is the um, – Got a lot of uh, professional sports uh, uh, people on board as influencers. And, um, and of course, it's owned by Canopy. So you have that Constellation connection there. Right. And, and I guess, the, well, why don't we start there? And uh, where does BioSteel fit in that non alk performance uh, space? And how do you get to market currently in the U.S.? All right. So when you look at what's going on in the, the sports market, in the sports industry, sports drinks, um, you look at you know the uh, Nielsen numbers, IRI, that kind of measure what's going on. It's about a $13.5 billion retail category in the United States. And so there's huge upside potential. And you, you mentioned earlier about your readership being you know primarily beer distributors. An awful lot of them are getting the attention of this category is getting the attention of them because to have that kind of you know, opportunity on the horizon that's so highly incremental to them that they're they're looking at this and saying, hey, it makes sense for us. Many of these places we go to already makes sense for us to uh, to get involved in this non elk space. So it's great right. to see more and more every every day, more and more uh, beer distributors getting behind the non elk side. And so thank you for talking about it. As you talk about it, they become more interested in the category. And well, realize listen, the, the margins there. are pretty good. You know, yeah, well, I'm not going to lie to you. Are good. The incrementality is better. <laughs> Right. So it's it's not like selling, you know, a case of BioSteel is taken away from a case of the beer portfolio coming off the truck. And so that's really a, a key piece why it's important and good for the beer network. And so as we go and we look at the marketplace uh, across the U.S., as you mentioned, we have some ties to Constellation through Canopy Growth and Constellation's, you know, ownership uh, uh, rights within Canopy. And so, uh, you know, Jim Sabe and the whole team, Bill Rensby helped introduce this brand to the distributors a couple of years ago. And many of the gold network distributors that uh, I know and love so well have taken the brand on and are doing some nice things with it. Um, but at the exact same time, we, you know, we, we're a tiny little emerging brand at this point in time. And so right. our, our job is to make sure the consumer is aware of the brand, that we help the distributors gain distribution by talking to the retailers. And all of that is getting better and better and better. And it's all supported by uh, probably the highest level of marketing support on a per case basis of any brand in the country from a beverage really? standpoint, because we're spending a lot of money to build awareness because we know that's what it takes. You have to be in this category to compete against the likes of Coke and Pepsi. Right. And, you know, we're not just talking about 
Gatorade and Powerade. You got to throw BioSteel in there. Is that where you want to fit? You want to be that fourth player? Yeah, we, uh, we believe that we have the opportunity as, uh, you know, there's a next generation of consumer evolving in this category, that we have the opportunity to be a great alternative to them, to the established brands. Um, right. And you know, bring something different to the market. Zero sugars, uh, you know, five essential electrolytes and, you know, each one of these little packets, uh, you know, that, that is really a good thing. So, um, you know, you don't get the sugar crash and all that kind of stuff that comes with some of the other brands in the category. By the way, those other brands are great. They, they drive the business and have, have built it into that $13 billion plus industry. It's just when it gets that big, you know, that there's some fragmentation coming. And so, you know, we think we can subset, subsegment a little bit and, and take advantage of that and give the consumer really what they're looking for. And, and we're seeing that, that happen. It seems like a category that's just ripe. It's so big and it's so dominated by very few players. And it's like a, you know, cotton candy in a bottle. It's, it's it does have a lot of sugar. And I think that's, I'm surprised uh, people haven't tackled that in a more, in a big way like you guys have. And we should mention to the to people at home, we do have a younger readership, Bruce. So people may not know that, of course, Bruce Jacobson uh, has been at Constellation uh, for, I don't know, nearly 20 years. And then with most, with Miller Coors back then uh, for 10 years before that, I, when it was only Miller, right. And I've, Bruce, and I've known you for, I don't know, probably 20 years and uh, uh, more, yeah. been a, a great, uh, great partner to work with. You did me a good favor. We were talking about it yesterday, actually on the podcast that, um, you know, uh, Paul Hederick and I were going at it over something, who knows what probably. And, you know, we're, we were, we're both stubborn. And you got us to meet face to face, and it yeah, it actually started a, a pretty good relationship uh, that uh, or at least a mutual respect from from then on, and uh, appreciated that in New York. It was a yeah, we sat in an upstairs bar in New York City. <laughs> that's <laughs> right. Destined locations. That that's exactly <laughs> right. And you know what? I mean, that just proves that just drinking a beer really does uh, bring people together. <laughs> so, it, it it does. Uh, miss Miss Paul. But okay, so uh, back to, to BioSteel, uh, you bought this facility that seems like a natural thing. You were already, they were already making it for you. They were probably stressed. You have the cash, boom. But being bought a boom, you own your facility, brings down your per margin, whatever, right? Yeah, we, so yeah, the, the purchase is really kind of the next evolution, you know, and there will be many of these type of evolutions. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about it as well, I'm sure, but the NHL deal was one of those, uh, you know, kind of okay. the next evolution for us. Uh, but from back to the production side of it, yeah, it just made sense for us to take a little bit more control over our supply chain. Um, we go to market in a Tetra pack, which is different, uh, differentiated from everything else in the category. And, you know, there's not widespread production on Tetra packs. And so we had the opportunity in working with Flow uh, to, to look at this and say, it makes sense for us to take ownership of this facility in Virginia. Uh, we're thrilled to have that group coming on board. Every single one of the Flow employees is coming over and working with us. Um, and uh, we've got people on the ground there right now, you know, helping make this transition work. Flow has been great about it uh, in, in helping us get to this point and as well as in kind of transition agreement that we're working with them for the next several months to make sure that we, we operate it the right way. And uh, it, it, it really is the next, next natural evolution, and that will create some economic value for us as well. Right. And there be, we just turn uh, that into the investment. And right. when, you, when you think about, okay, so what do you do with the money? It's, we know that we're here competing in a tough category against some very well-established brands, and they're very good at what they do. We have to continue to invest. And so anything that we can save on the production side, we get the opportunity to use in other ways. If, if, you know, be it manpower in the marketplace, dealing with the chains, talking to them about what the brand is all about, helping get distribution there. Or, or spending it on the airwaves and, and helping uh, the, the marketing pull and the awareness of the brand continue to grow. So th that's what this deal is all about. Um, you know, we're, we're really excited about this next step uh, for BioSteel. Will there be a relationship, uh, a larger relationship with Flow that extends from this? Um, perhaps a purchase? You know, do you see BioSteel as becoming a hydration company like platform? Well, I, I think we're primarily a hydration company today, Jordan. Um, when you look at, you know, where we see the area of emphasis, we have a, a, a long line of protein drinks and sports, you know, sports enhancement type uh, I, products that we come to the market with. But our, our, our primary focus is around uh, the sports hydration. So uh, we will continue a longer relationship with Flow. They have a facility in Canada. And so some of our 
uh, production needs that we'll have for the uh, for Canada will will be produced in Canada. So we do a, a number of like limited time offers where we'll take and extend a sponsorship um, uh, of a particular sports entity that we are associated with, and we'll create a flavor just for them, and you know we'll roll it out in the marketplace. Uh, and we've been very successful doing that, especially in Canada, where we're a little bit more established than we are in the States. Uh, we've done that with 7-Eleven and Circle K in Canada. Uh, we've got a couple of other ones on the books where we're going to produce a limited time offer that will go through selected retailers. Uh, and then that helps kind of raise the awareness. Um, when you think you know, we look at Canada as kind of the testing ground to where we can go in the United States. You know, obviously, it's you know it's much smaller uh, and the brands had a little bit more presence up there because it's a Canadian based brand and it's been around for you know, over 10 years up there. So people know the BioSteel name much better than they do in the States. And so we look at what's going on in Canada and say, you know, that's kind of the blueprint for what the future looks like in the U.S. And so doing, you know, uh, limited time offer packages and stuff like that tied to select retailers to help, you know, strengthen that relationship, as well as to be able to leverage any kind of the sports marketing pieces and the entities that we have with that, it just makes sense. And we see that in, in Canada, you know, we are over a five share of isotonics and convenience and gas. And so, uh, and you look at you know, a market like Toronto that, uh, I, I get to Toronto a lot these days, and it feels like I was like wondering a, if you did you know, your typical <laughs> yeah. North American city, Chicago or yeah. Los Angeles or Dallas. It feels much like those, and in, in that market, you know, we're high, we're almost double what that five share is. So, mm. um, it just in, in that marketplace. So we know that the upside's there as long as we do the right things to build a great foundation under the brand, and that's what we're in the midst of doing right now: investing to build a foundation, um, and uh, the, the production side is going to help us do that. Well, I mean, Canada is America's test market. <laughs> it's a different market, though. The consumer, uh, the yeah. consumer is very aware of what's going on, and you know they're very proud of Canadian roots of brands and, and right. that type of thing. The retail environment is similar, yet at the same time, uh, it's it's slightly different. And so, uh, yeah, we we see it as, as something that we can not just kind of plug and play, pull it out of Canada and stick it in the United States. It's not going to work exactly that way. But what we learn in Canada gives us the ability to bring it to the States. And uh, when we talk to customers about what's going on, use, uh, you know, any, any of the customers that kind of are across border, they see what we're doing in Canada and they, they give us the opportunity to say, okay, now prove that you can do that. We'll give you the license to be able to prove that you can do that. And so we've got a lot of retailers that see, you know, see us on both sides of the borders and, even though we're a much smaller brand in the States right now, they're giving us the support uh, because they see where we can go. Yeah. And by the way, with this category growing, uh, it's projected to go from in the States, it's projected to go from about $13.5 billion in revenue uh, at the retail level to over $18 billion by 2026. So a growing category, we're seeing the, the sets at the retailers being getting larger. Uh, and when they do that, they're adding more selection into that. And although the market share is very highly concentrated in two players, there are many other players, us included, that are getting included in new sets that are taking place because of, you know, helping uh, kind of diversify the portfolio for the retailers. Does Bio still go through um, beer distributors in Canada? We go through, uh, yeah, it's, it's a similar market. It's, okay. uh, yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of area to cover in Canada. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the same system, you know, when you go to something from Ontario uh, to Alberta, as an example, it's, it's a slightly different system just because of the population bases are different. But yeah, we use much the same type of DSD uh, in, in Canada. Gotcha. And what has, uh, you know, distributor feedback been like so far since you came on this summer? Well, it, it, it varies. I mean, there's a range because the brand's working really well in some places and not so well in others. In fact, interestingly, uh, this morning, I've received an awful lot of texts from old friends who are reading about us uh, <laughs> in, the, uh, in, in your, um, you know, your publication this morning. Uh, one of them came out of, of Florida. And so I don't know if you know Jeff Wetback, but Jeff is at Pepin. Uh, mm -hmm. and they do a really nice job. Great hockey city. So our brand you know, has some real good presence there because it's a natural fit for our brand. And, and Jeff was just talking about, you know, hey, things are going well. 
And the reason things are going well in a place like that is because we have great retail support in that market as well. The Walmarts across Florida, Publix across Florida are doing some really good things for us. And so it really, it's a simple business, but that doesn't make it easy, right? You have to build brand awareness. The consumer has to be looking for you. And then you have to, you know, gain the favor of the retailers so that they look at and say, hey, you can add something to our business. And that's what we're finding right now. There's an awful lot of retailers saying, I see what you can add to our business. And we'll give you the opportunity to to show us what you can do, uh, even though it isn't a big brand yet. Yeah, yeah, and, but, and break that duopoly up. You know, yeah. it's it's not it's not healthy. So you got to have that third and fourth player. Well, ultimately, the consumer makes that decision, and so we know that our energy and our efforts have to be against building consumer awareness and consumer demand for the brand. Uh, and then retailers uh, realize that you know that becomes their shopper and their customer, and so. When we can get the consumer asking for it and we tie that to uh, increased distribution, it turns into velocity that the retailer says, okay, I like this and I can watch it grow. And our, our velocity is still relatively low, uh, but at the same time, it's growing double digit literally month after month after month as we're looking at it. I, I completely disagree. The consumer is always wrong and <laughs> you, you gotta, you've got to train them. <laughs> yeah, this I, is why. I think that. That's I why I'm in a B2B lot, business, but, uh, you know, I think there's Bruce, an awful lot of brands laying beside the road uh, yeah. that, that attempted to do it without convincing the consumer. And uh, we are not right. going to be one of those. We will be the ones that, uh, you know, continue to be focused on the consumer because when we know we deliver for them, they will naturally find us. And, uh, you know, that's what we see. You know, we see going from, uh, you know, kind of an athletic consumer or somebody who's really athletically inspired and they find the brand. And the next thing you know, the brand is in the household. And everybody in the household then starts picking up BioSteel and they're using it for their everyday refreshing. Um, we, we've seen evidence of that in Canada. We see evidence of the very, very early stages of that in the United States. We've got a lot of brand building still to do in the States. And uh, we are very focused on just making the brand as strong as we can. I've had the privilege over the years to work with some really, really strong brands. Um, and it's amazing what great, how good an individual can look when they have good brands that they're working. <laughs> oh, yeah. Go ahead, Jordan. I was going to say, uh, you know, we talked about it a couple of times um, throughout this conversation, but I, I still wanted to dive a little bit deeper on the, the sentiment from beer distributors towards non-alc. Have you found most getting on board or there are still some that you kind of have to convince to hop on this train? Well, I, Jordan, I think they're kind of across the spectrum. You, you've had, you have some beer distributors that have been doing non-alcs. Oh man! Since I got in the industry back in the you know the late '80s, early '90s, uh, and so they're very well versed at doing it. You also have a group that understands, probably because of reading about it on a regular basis, and you guys bringing that opportunity to the surface on a regular basis in your publication that hey, there's something here. And if we're delivering you know 12 ounce units of beer, we can deliver you know 500 ml units of bio steel, and you know, we can we go to many of those same stores. So they're realizing that. But just like it's stepping into any new industry, you have to learn a little bit about what that means. And, you know, the way you approach the retailer is slightly different. And so even if you think about a merchandiser going into the store, you know, the real basis of the business and the merchandisers, they have to walk to a different section of the store. And while they may be doing 95% of their business over in that beer cooler and building displays, they have to remember to go past the hydration section and stop and, and, and make sure that everything is merchandised properly. Um, and, you know, kind of like uh, we're using a, a, a comment with our distributor network about hydrate first. And that's obviously a health idea as well, because, the you know, the hydration message is getting much stronger about what hydration and the great values of hydration are for the human body. But at the same time, it's like, you know, make sure you stop by that hydration category as you go in. Um, and then and you do the work there first and then go do your 95 percent of the work at the beer cooler. We understand that. And so just make sure that it gets its due justice. And then over the course of time, the category sort of grows. So yeah. that's we've what heard, that's, we've heard that's, that tactic and then, by before. The way, I'm sorry, Harry. We've, we've heard that that tactic recently being bandied about that for beer distributors to tell their pre-salesmen and merchandisers, hey, just go to the non out first, get it over right. with, knock it out. Yeah. It's small. It's easy. And right. then tackle the beer because you're not going to forget, forget about beer. Anyway, so, so that's uh, so that's the spectrum, but but there's also a significant group that aren't involved at all at all in the non yeah. business, and 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 the the fact that the distributors are across the spectrum like that actually creates some challenges for the beer network as a whole, and right. you know I, I think you see that in you know strategic non elk brands 
leaving the beer network because it, it isn't as consistent across the system. And so anything, you know, beer distributors are committed to the beer category. There's no question that that's the case. And so that doesn't even come up in the mindset of a supplier on the beer side. However, when you think about the NA side, you, you have to service every store in the chain that authorizes you. And you've got to find a route to market. And right now, that's a that's kind of a tough puzzle to put together in the beer industry. So mm-hmm. I think when you, you think about long-term strategic opportunities in beer, it really is a long-term commitment as a, to the category of non-helps that the beer system needs to make. And then I think you're going to start to see more strategic buyers of big brands as they're, or brands as they're emerging are going to end up being suppliers that primarily go through beer, where today you're seeing it's primarily suppliers that go through non-help suppliers. So right. it's, it's, it's going a, to be an evolution. Uh, but it is an interesting... Well, you're right. You're absolutely right. And it's an interesting catch-22 because the reason some of these distributors don't want to get in is because there's no protections and they're, they're, they could get yanked. And so they don't want to build the brand and have it yanked. On the other hand, might as well make hay while the sun's shining, make those margins. Yeah, it might get yanked, but maybe you're better for it. But I get it. It's hard to ramp up and then ramp down and ramp up. It's it's not fun. Well, and, it, it's not. It, but that's actually, when you think about it, that's a, that's a long-term plan. So right. if the Beer Network wants to be a beverage distribution network, it has to have a long-term vision of what that looks like. Uh, I've actually talked to Lester Jones. I'm a big fan of Lester, and every once in a while, he'll drop me a a text message and show me uh, him drinking a bio steel or something like that, and uh, we'll get on the phone together. And I've had that conversation. It's kind of, you know, as a segment, it's important that someone has a long-term strategy of building toward being beverage distributors versus kind of haphazardly letting it just evolve on its own. It'll be much, much slower, and a lot of good brands will be lost, I think, because of that. Yeah. I, I agree. You got, you got to, it's got to kind of be all or nothing because you don't want to have a patchwork network and have holes. <clears throat> it's different. It's different. It's well, as a supplier, it's difficult to manage that. Right. Yeah. And just so many distributors too. And uh, that's a whole different subject for a whole different podcast, <laughs> but uh, I wanted to get down what I think, you know, not knowing anything, especially about non-alc, but the crux of the, challenge that you have is that consumers just aren't used to buying that tip type of beverage in a tetra pack and you know i'm a i'm a big uh, fan of tetra pack and i think consumers are too in general because they know it's more sustainable they know it's lighter it's it's clearly more recyclable and everything but that they don't i don't think people gatorade they're used in that clear plastic bottle and it's hard to get away from that so how do how do you uh, tackle that issue well, it, it, to us, the, the Tetra Pack is kind of central to who we are. We, we think of it as kind of the next uh, iteration, the next generation of packaging. And with that, we see the next generation of consumer coming to that. So I would, I would agree that, the, the, you know, the PET bottle um, is likely, you know, it is, it's the standard for the segment. Um, and yet, as you see new individuals uh, coming into the category as early stage consumers and earlier in their lives, this is, this is a non-elk, so you have the ability to, to speak to younger consumers, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, and we look at that consumer and they tell us that the Tetra is much more important to them than it is to somebody twice their age, as an example. Uh, and that's not a surprise. So we, we see Tetra um, as we're kind of on the leading edge of that. That's not always the greatest plot, spot to be, but it gives us a point of differentiation where we can say we are different. And that's what we're also hearing from the retailers, that, you know, that differentiation makes a difference. We actually had a retailer uh, talk to us about uh, doing some uh, work for them in Tetra, you know, just recently, I just we just announced this deal uh, where they're planning on, you know, at some point in time, maybe being out of the PET business on especially anything that would be private label to them. And so the, those types of things could create opportunities. And so I think you're going to see continuing emergence of this. Uh, there's probably not a ton of consumers today that buy it simply because it's in the Tetra Pack. But we believe that as today's younger consumers continue to make decisions more and more um, with what they're buying, that that will become more important to them. Right. Well, Jordan, do, do you have anything else to add? Um, I'm looking at some of the questions. Oh, I think one that everyone wants to know is, you know, Constellation and Canopy, they recently you know, restructured their relationship, pretty complex, but 
does anything from that change anything um, about how y'all go to market or y'all's long-term vision with BioSteel? Well, it, it doesn't change it much, Jordan. Um, you know, Constellation is a great partner to have. You know, helping with this, you know, from uh, I mentioned Bill Rensby and Jim Sabia a few minutes ago when we were talking, um, you know, they helped us make those connections to the right distributors and the right markets. And that was before I joined uh, BioSteel, uh, you know, the first quarter of this year. Uh, they helped them do that about two years ago. So that was a great lead into that. Um, you know, every once in a while we would get some IRI or consumer information from them. Um, but at this point in time, Canopy is turning into an organization that is very consumer driven. So we have the ability to kind of lean on Canopy a little bit more for some of those things going forward in the future. So uh, all in all, it's, it's not going to dramatically change the relationship. Um, I mean, many of the, the connections to the distributors that and to the retailers that Constellation could help us with, um, you know, are kind of built into our system at this point in time. I have a few people that I know in the industry that I could give a call to. Um, you know, to help us out when that needs to be, be, be done, just like um, Constellation would be able to help us with that. So I think in the early stages, it was really, really critical of the support that we had of a strategic partner like that. Uh, and they've helped us build a really good foundation to to play off of this point where they have to take a step back uh, to, to, to satisfy the needs of that, you know, uh, more complicated relationship with Canopy. Well, I mean, Canopy got what it wanted. They got you. I mean, I mean, not, not to, not to blow smoke, but I mean, you, you have those distributor contacts. You've been in this business forever and everybody likes you apparently. Uh, I don't know why. Okay, well, maybe not no. everybody, but yeah. No, but I mean, you know, and that, that is very valuable and, and you know, it, it takes a beer guy to sell non alk I've always said that, but. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, I'll tell you, I can't believe how much I've learned in the last six months. I, I took the first hundred days. Uh, in joining the organization and said, you know, I'm here to understand the brand, understand the team and understand the industry. And it's amazing the differences in the industry. So even when you think about building a brand, which is what we are in the midst of doing is building a brand. Because I, I, as I said earlier, I've been associated with some really strong brands and I know the value of having a strong brand. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to do it the right way, build a brand. Um, but in this industry, you don't build in this side type of the industry you don't build it in bars and restaurants that's right. that's not the on that we don't have an on-premise presence really to speak of there are other places to build the brand and we are investing from a marketing standpoint to make sure we're finding the early stage consumers in the marketplace where they're at uh, a term we use all the time is points of sweat so you think about you know where is it that somebody is drinking you know, a biosteel or a need of hydration like that. Think of, think of points of sweat. So, you know, gyms are a really easy one just to use as an example. And so not a lot of beer distributors go to gyms. So you got to find a different route to those. And you, by the way, have to be at that gym before it makes sense in the Walmart, the Publix, and the Kroger, right? right. Because right. you got to build the demand somewhere. So like um, being, in a, being in a craft centric bar early yeah, on, it's, it's on draft. Just, would be yeah, it, the, the equivalent in the beer side. And, and when, you know, Jordan and I both laughed when you said that beer distributors aren't in gyms because we took it literally like they don't <laughs> go to gym. Like, and because I was like, you know, I haven't seen buyers steal because that's because I don't go to places where you sweat, you know? <laughs> so so at your at your up, upcoming Breakers event, um, as you're making your way to the stage beforehand, walk by the gym. You're going to see an awful uh, lot of beer distributors <laughs> in that gym. No, I, and I do know that, the, the, especially, uh, the, from my generation down. Um, all right. Well, uh, we have kept you long enough. Uh, I really do thank you for, for being on and, uh, I, I wish you all the best. I, I think it's a great product. As I said, I am anything in Tetra pack, I think is the future. Um, and I think consumers are catching up to that fact pretty quickly now. I, I thank I thank you guys for the time as well, and uh, thank all the listeners out there um, um, that are you know driving around in their car, listening to you between stops, that type of thing. Um, you know that yeah. group is the backbone of any three tier distribution system, and yeah. uh, as the supplier uh, in, in my days at Constellation representing Corona and Modelo, uh, we had tremendous amount of support from merchandisers and drivers and, you know, the sales reps and the sales supervisors and all of that group. And uh, we can't do what we want to do with BioSteel without similar support. And so we're here to help make that easy for them to build a really strong brand, a lot of consumer demand, keep that investment coming, have some BioSteel representation in the marketplace, you know, with, with human capital as well to, 
to help them do their job so so they can look at this and say, wow, you know, remember when this was a small brand? That, that's where right. we're going. All right. That sounds good. All right. Well, thank you guys. Rachel, thanks for uh, setting it up. And uh, we'll see you down the road and we'll check in with you in a couple months, see how it's going. All right.